9. Chasing Shadows Blake stepped under the police tape that sealed the threshold of Peter Justin's apartment. The place was in shambles. The Hollywood cops had given it a thorough going over. A sofa was overturned, its stuffing ripped out and strewn about the small living room. Yellowed photographs of Russian farmers and the spires of St. Peter's Cathedral had been pulled off the walls. Potted cacti that had once rested on the windowsill had been uprooted, their sandy soil scattered. Fortunately, the police were done with the place. Not that they found a clue. Paladin had reluctantly been given permission, after a few well-placed phone calls from Lockheed, to look the apartment over. Late afternoon sunlight filtered through the panes of the window, casting four clean squares of illumination that seemed far too orderly when projected onto the chaos. Amateurs, Paladin muttered, and gingerly placed the prone cacti into their pots. Peter Justin had run a clandestine operation past his own security at Lockheed for weeks, maybe even months. Did Detective Sloghauser and his crew think the wily Russian would be stupid enough to hide anything of value here? The cops were looking for obvious signs of criminal activity. Stolen goods, wads of cash, incriminating photos, and the like. The cops were way off target, though. Justin was too subtle and too smart to simply leave damning evidence lying around his apartment. Peering out the second-story window, Paladin saw La Cinega Boulevard below, and the trolley station across the street. The place must get noisy in the morning with all the cars rolling in and out of the track. Justin made a bundle of cash as a Lockheed executive. So why live in this crummy neighborhood? Paladin stepped into the bedroom, cringing at the pants, shirts, and sheets that looked like they had been through a tornado. There were slashes in the mattress, and handfuls of wadding had been scattered haphazardly around the room. Part of the wrought iron headboard had been unscrewed. He spied the gleam of gold in the corner and moved closer. A picture of the Virgin Mary, framed in gold leaf scroll work, had been overturned. Nearby, a dozen jelly jars holding candles were toppled over, too, but were remarkably intact. Their wicks had been recently trimmed, and soot marks on the glass had been wiped clean. One of the jars, however, had heavy dribbles of red wax on its side, as though it had been tipped over while still lit. It was nothing. Still, it struck Paladin as oddly out of place. Peter Justin, with his fastidious habits and immaculately tailored suits, would have kept this place as neat as a pin. So what was one candle doing with all this dribbling of wax? Maybe because he had done something so fast that he had forgotten or hadn't had time to clean up? Most likely, it was just meaningless wax. Paladin started back toward the living room, stopped and, on a whim, ran his hand over the back panel of the picture. Smooth wood grain. He brushed across the front. It was smooth, too. No, not quite. A tiny scar of slick candle wax marred the otherwise glassy surface. Obscured from casual observation by the glitter of gold leaf and lacquer, he tilted the picture in the light and saw a faint wax imprint, a circle with a stem. The circle had reversed numbers printed on it. L9879. The stem had a jagged side, the outline of a key. Paladin reached into his pocket. This was a long shot, but he had lifted a signet ring and a key from the pale man's zeppelin. The key he had pilfered from the pirates, while similar in shape, had no numbers. If you want to live, a female voice behind Paladin announced, just keep your hand in your pocket. 
paladin froze when he heard the cold, metallic ratcheting of a piston's hammer locking in place. He slowly stood and turned, keeping his hand in his pocket. A woman stood in the bedroom doorway. She wore a free Colorado Zephyr's baseball cap, a fly jacket zipped to her breastbone, and loose pants that were tucked into a pair of shiny knee-high boots. Waves of red hair had been tucked into her cap. Her black-gloved hands steadily held a massive forty-five revolver. The skin above her open collar bore the swirls and traces of flames, tattooed flames. Paladin knew her face instantly, a face that had been on several wanted posters in Hollywood, Texas, and Utah. Lady Kali, recently employed by the Pale Man. You have one free hand, she said. Use it to open the left side of your coat. No sudden moves, please. She smiled, since it would be a shame to shoot such a handsome specimen. Her smile slowly hardened into a line of clenched teeth, and Paladin saw that a few of those teeth had been filed to points. Paladin opened his coat, revealing his holster, the butt of his thirty-eight revolver, and his handcuffs. Use two fingers, she ordered him, and place the gun and cuffs on the floor, then kick them here. Her eyes were dark, and they didn't waver from his for a second. Paladin complied. Your wallet next. Toss it to me. Did she recognize him? Then again, why should she? She may have gotten only a glance of his filthy face at the pale man's military outpost, and he had been wearing a dirty coverall then, not his Grey Brooks brother's suit. He fished out his wallet and tossed it to her. Lady Kali didn't try to catch it. She let it fall at her boots. Turn around, she said. Paladin wasn't about to rush a confirmed killer with a gun pointed at his heart. But he wondered if he'd get it in the back and die facing Justin's little shrine to the Madonna. Blake, she said. Never heard of you. Let me see your face again. Paladin exhaled and turned around. Every day he wished Blake Aviation Security was big enough to scare pirates out of the skies from here to the Empire State. This once, though, the tiny stature of his company was a blessing. You're no cop, she said, looking him up and down appraisingly. No badge? No cheap suit. So what's with the bracelets? And what are you doing here? Paladin carefully removed his hand from his pocket. Mind if I sit? He nodded to the torn mattress. Go ahead, she replied, and she lowered her aim a notch from his heart to his stomach. What was she doing in here? Could Lady Kali and Justin have been friends? That didn't figure. Justin wouldn't endanger his patriotic operation by fraternizing with the hired help. Nor would the pale man trust a mercenary with sensitive reconnaissance work. That left only one reason for the deadly aviatrix's presence. Cash. I'm a private investigator, Paladin told her. Did a little pavement pounding for Justin. That wasn't too far from the truth. Lady Kali must have sensed that because she lowered her gun, then sighed and stuck it in her belt. Did he stiff you too? she asked. It was nice and professional for a while, wasn't it? Paladin said. But things apparently went to hell in the desert, and everyone disappeared or suddenly developed amnesia, at least as far as my money is concerned. All I ended up with is a measly retainer and more bills than I can cover. She chewed on her lower lip, thinking, then said, Maybe we can help one another. She dug a packet of cigarettes from her leather jacket and offered one to Paladin. He took it and she lit it for him. You're the detective. Where do you figure the pale man is? 
The question threw Paladin for a heartbeat. She didn't know? And what do I get paid for my services? He inquired. Why blink, she said, and batted her eyes. You get to live. Her pointed smile returned. And maybe if you tell me something I like, I can sweeten the deal. Paladin eased back with all the nonchalance he could muster. It's like this. Justin paid me to follow up on rumors that Lockheed was missing some expensive experimental equipment. After a while, I figure he's the one that grabbed the stuff and just wants me to cover his tracks. I have no problem with that. All part of the business, if you get my meaning. Lady Kali nodded and sat on the mattress. Not too close but not too far away from him either. Apparently she was more at ease with one of her own kind. Paladin was momentarily distracted by her scent. Lilacs mixed with aviation fuel. He shook his head to regain his composure, though he was sure that Lady Kali had seen his momentary lapse and was amused by it. The last thing I heard from Justin was that there was a problem with the prototype. He flew off to Lockheed's base near Palm Spring. Paladin shrugged. Later, I got word that he bought the farm in some air crash. The police came up here for a visit. The housekeeping is their handiwork, not mine, by the way. After they left, I let myself in to see what they missed. The next thing I know, he added, a beautiful woman with a gun shows up. Lady Kali drew on her cigarette and blew a perfect ring and? And nothing. I've laid my cards on the table. Now it's your turn. Tell me what you know, and I might be able to track down the pale man. If he was paying Justin, then maybe we can both collect. Lady Kali shifted and stared at Paladin. Her jaw clenched. Then she relaxed and draped an arm over the wrought iron headboard. Okay, Blake, I'll take a chance on a pretty face. Her eyes narrowed to smoldering slits. Cross me, though, and it'll be your last mistake. I figured as much. Paladin looked away from her and pretended to examine the burning tip of his untouched cigarette. The pale man, she finally whispered, he had something big planned. Not the Lockheed prototype. That was just one of his small-time operations leading up to something big, Really big. This guy has three zeppelins, eight squadrons of planes, mechanics, and enough ammunition to start a small war. Only, he's cagey, walking on eggshells every step of the way. Doesn't make too much sense, does it? Maybe, maybe not. So what happened to these big plans? What happened? Her eyebrows shot up. Someone took off with the prototype, and the pale man started grousing about a rat in his ranks. He ditched us when we touched down in free Colorado. I barely had enough cash to get back here. It's a good thing Justin's dead or I would have killed him myself. I see, Paladin said. He could sense a pattern forming in this whole caper, but it didn't quite make sense yet. Here. Lady Kali flipped open the cylinder of Paladin's revolver and dumped the bullets into her palm. If we're going to be partners, you might as well have this back. She handed the gun to Paladin. Thanks, Paladin said, and stuck it in his holster. The cuffs too, please? She twirled them once around her index finger. What are you going to use them for? Her smile part seductive, part predatory, gave Paladin the chills. You'll see. He mirrored her leer and leaned closer, near enough to feel the heat from her face upon his. Hmm, I can see you're taking this partnership seriously, she murmured, her hands moving toward his face, her eyes closing, her lips parting, until Paladin snatched the handcuffs from her. With a cat-like move, he snapped one shackle on her wrist. He slapped the other around the iron post of the bed frame. His free hand grabbed the gun from her belt. Lady Collie let out a strangled scream and lunged for him. 
She was fast, with the reflexes of a seasoned combat pilot. Paladin barely avoided the brunt of her attack, but not before she landed a sharp blow on his shoulder. Paladin aimed her gun at her chest. I appreciate that a mercenary like you wants to get paid, but I want the pale man for my own reason, Lady Kali. A reason that pirate scum like you will never understand. What reason? She spat, still struggling with her restraints. Paladin backed into the corner near the Madonna icon. He carefully confirmed the backward number in the wax impression, L9879, and then scratched it off. He kept the gun trained on Lady Kali as he edged out of the bedroom. Justice, he said. You better warm up to the concept. You're going to get a taste of Hollywood justice after I call the cops. Paladin left the apartment building, ignoring Lady Kali's screamed obscenities as he crossed La Cinega Boulevard and entered the trolley terminal. He took out the key he had lifted from the pale man's zeppelin. It looked like it matched the imprint in Justin's picture, though the serial number had since been filed off. There was, Blake mused, a good reason for Justin to live in this crummy neighborhood after all. It was a perfect transfer point, a place where information could be anonymously exchanged at a moment's notice. No one down here paid any attention to the activities of others. People who noticed too much or were seen talking to the cops tended to meet sudden and nasty ends. Justin could also watch all the comings and goings in the neighborhood just in case someone tried to engineer a double cross. Paladin strolled into the terminal lobby, his shoes clicking across the well-worn terracotta tiles. He took a left, past the cafeteria, and found a wall of lockers. A nickel rented you a bread box size container. It was a nice hiding spot if, for example, you had something you didn't want the cops to find, or you needed to move secrets between two parties. He stopped at locker L9879. Paladin took his pilfered key and smoothly slid it into the lock. It clicked open. 10. Pirate Tryouts So, what does it mean? Paladin asked Dashiel. He leaned forward on the edge of the chase lounge, trying to not ruffle the silk fabric. When Paladin had seen the contents of Justin's locker, he brought it all up to Dashiel's Hollywood Hills bungalow. It was private up here. Neither Lockheed, the police, nor anyone else would be getting through the gated community unannounced. Until Paladin knew more about what he had found, he wasn't taking any chances with anyone, not even the people who were supposed to be on the side of the angels. It means trouble, Dashiel said with an unlit cigarette dangling from his mouth. He was wrapped with concentration, poring over the architectural diagrams that had been laid across his Persian rug. The blueprints had been in the locker along with a manila envelope containing $3,000 and a note scrolled with neat cursive that stated, Need a dozen pilots, must have their own aircraft, must not be afraid to fight, money as usual, not an issue. Dalwick Airfield, dusk, July 7th. Today was July 7th. What kind of trouble? Paladin asked and crossed his arms. Dashiel stood, straightened his navy blue satin lounging robe, finally lit his cigarette and took a long draw. For a man who has been to so many exotic places, Paladin, he exhaled silver smoke, I'm shocked you do not recognize it. The long rectangular wings and the enormous central round gallery, the marble cornices and colonnades. Paladin stared at the building's cross-section, but saw only white lines and blue smudges. It's the old Capitol building, Dashiel told him, in Washington, nation of Columbia. Sure, he muttered. I see it now. It was more than just the white marbled rotunda Paladin was seeing. He saw the vague outlines of what Lady Kali had called the pale man's big plans. He wasn't sure what those plans were exactly, only that he was liking them less and less. The note, 
Dashiel said, appears to be written by a woman of distinction and breeding. And from what you have told me, I can only surmise these pilots she refers to are replacements for Lady Kali and her cohorts. Paladin got up and paced. Okay, that takes care of the contents of the late Peter Justin's locker and the key and the black cigarettes I found on the pale man's zeppelin. But there's one last piece of the puzzle to fit. This. Paladin handed Dashiel the gold signet ring with a cabochon of jade he had borrowed from the pale man's desk. Carved in relief on the stone was an eagle with talons extended around a star. Dashiel raised an eyebrow. You recognize it? Yes, Dashiel remarked as he tried to get the ring on for size. It was too big. I'd say getting caught with this number would buy you a rubber hose massage from the Hollywood police and three years hard labor. You're quite lucky a Slughauser didn't see it. He returned the ring to Paladin. We used a similar prop in a recent film. Had to cut that scene, though. The censors didn't... The note said dusk, Paladin reminded him. I've got three hours, maybe, to make it to that airfield and stop what's going on. Just tell me what the ring is. Dashiel sighed. Unionists, my dear paladin. The rampant eagle clutching a star was the symbol of one of the splinter factions. The Brotherhood of America, I believe they called themselves. As far as I know, its members had all either been caught or killed. Perhaps those reports were in error. Unionists. Since the breakup of the United States, a handful of anarchic splinter groups had appeared, all crying for the reunification under the old American banner. Paladin sympathized with their goals until a handful of the more fanatical groups started lobbing bombs to achieve their ends. Today, the word unionist was synonymous with mad bomber and crank. Paladin whispered, I've never heard of unionists with battle zeppelins, squadrons of planes, or buckets of cash to throw around. And why a blueprint of the old Capitol building? You'd think they'd revere it as the center of their America. He stared into thin air, trying to see the connection. Dashiel got up, frowned, and ground his cigarette in a crystal ashtray. I know that look. It's your nothing is going to stop me until I solve this even if it kills me look. So let's pretend this time that I tried to talk you out of it and you ignored me. That way you can get to that airfield before the sun sets. Just do me a favor. Dashiel dug into the magazine rack next to the chase lounge and withdrew a holstered forty-four. Take this. Since you lost your forty-five, you'll need a replacement. Something other than that sissy thirty-eight you insist on carrying. A gun like that could get you killed. Despite his recent mishaps in the air, Paladin felt the weight of this case lift from his chest the moment the wheels of his plane parted from the runway. Lightning Girl, a modified Curtis Wright P-2 Warhawk, was Paladin's current favorite. Tennyson had tinkered with the three-stock Wright R-1350 engines and coaxed out a quarter more horsepower than they had been rated for. She burned quarts of oil and guzzled fuel like a bonfire, but she was faster than anyone suspected a warhawk could be, a surprise that had saved his skin on more than one occasion. But speed wasn't why Paladin had named her Lightning Girl. Her standard guns had been replaced with four sixty caliber Smith & Wesson Scorpion cannons. Tennyson had engineered a double set of triggers on the stick, one over the other for each pair of guns. Using two fingers, squeezing both triggers at the same time, all four guns could be fired simultaneously. The blazing lead, streaks of tracers, and sheer mayhem that Lightning Girl could deliver was an awesome sight. So far, no one had seen her spit fire and live to tell her secret. Paladin nosed his plane up, banked east, and headed toward Riverside and Dalewick Airfield. The layer of nimbus clouds had settled around 4,000 feet, a white and gray inverted landscape that glowed gold and orange as the sun set. Below, large boulders dotted the landscape. White and yellow washes of soil made meandering patterns broken by an occasional emerald patch of avocado grove. 
To the south were rolling hills, and farther, the San Bernardino Mountains, the highest peaks still capped with snow. Nice country. Dalewick Airfield surfaced the region's handful of seasonal crop dusters. Paladin had stopped over before. It was a smooth patch of dirt runway and a radio shack, as close to civilization as the middle of nowhere could be. A speck hovered in the distance, then another, then three more. Hard to tell, but there must have been twenty aircraft circling like buzzards over Dalewick. And they weren't crop dusters. As Paladin got closer, he saw these planes were painted in gaudy colors and sported a variety of emblems. Fiery horses, crossed rifles, and falcon silhouettes. There were six Grumman Avengers, a Ravenscroft Coyote, a pair of new M210 Ravens, and a few battered PR-1 Defenders. Paladin flipped on his radio and tuned in the airfield's frequency. Dalewick, come in. This is 3 Delta 475 requesting permission to land. There was a hiss of static, then... Denied, 3 Delta 475. This is an invitation-only party. Better scram while you can, buster. That definitely was no Hollywood-certified radio operator. Dalewick, this is 3 Delta 475. I was invited. Justin sent me. Before his last flight. I've already been paid to show up. You want me to leave? I'll just pocket the money. It's all the same to me. The radio crackled with silence for three heartbeats. Okay, 3 Delta 475, join in. We were odd anyway. Odd? Now what does that mean? He wondered. Paladin didn't want to blow his cover, so he just kept his mouth shut. 3 Delta 475, your partner is Foxtrot 419er. That's the Red J2 Fury. Roger that, Dalewick. Paladin would play along. Partner probably meant he had been assigned a wingman. Maybe for a test of skill? Planes buzzed around under and over Lightning Girl as they all continued to circle the airfield. He spotted the Red J-2 Fury, which also bore a silver snake emblem coiled on each wing. Nice and subtle. The Fury was circling directly across from Lightning Girl. Paladin eased back on the throttle so they could catch up. The little red plane slowed too, however matching his speed and keeping a fixed position across from him. Hell of a lousy wingman, Paladin muttered. The radio crackled. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the show's on. Let's see what you're made of. Gunfire erupted, and every plane veered from the circling formation. The Red J-2 banked and dived toward the underside of Paladin's bird. A defender on his wingtip shattered as a rocket exploded over the cockpit. Paladin reflexively banked hard to starboard. So this recruitment of Justin's was apparently open to only a select few. That's what the ground controller meant by partner. Not wingman. The J-2 Fury was Paladin's target, and Lightning Girl was the Furies. Paladin inverted Lightning Girl, rolling upside down to get a better look. The nimble J-2 Fury was attempting to come up under him to align its deadly 70 caliber cannon and make short work of him. Nice try, Paladin growled. The Fury was lighter and faster than his Warhawk, even with Tennyson's modifications. But the Fury was nose-heavy and could stall even at a moderate angle of attack unless the pilot knew exactly what he was doing. Still inverted, Paladin poured on the speed and climbed into a loop. The Fury followed him, almost straight up. He leveled out at 3,000 feet. He had to. Ribbons of smoke poured from his port engine. Lightning Girl couldn't take much more. Beneath him, however, the Fury sputtered black smoke and her nose dipped. The pilot quickly recovered from the stall and leveled out. That was all the invitation Paladin needed. The Fury's pilot must have realized his mistake. He dived. Now it was Paladin's turn to pursue. He opened up the throttle and the full weight of his Warhawk gave him a crucial speed advantage. Lightning Girl fell toward her prey like a meteor. The Fury rolled to port, a mistake at stall speed. If he had continued a full power dive, he might have gotten close to the ground and pulled out at the last moment. A Warhawk wouldn't be able to match such a maneuver. 
Paladin didn't hesitate to exploit his enemy's error. The instant the Fury lined up in his sights, he opened fire with the outer pair of 60 caliber guns. Bullets streaked past the Fury's wingtip. He let all four guns blaze. The noise was deafening, louder than the trio of engines at full speed. The Warhawk's frame shuddered, but Paladin held her steady in the dive, ruddered her over, and let the torrent of bullets spray across the Fury. A moment later, amid a fountain of red paint chips, the Fury fell, her snake decorations obliterated by the dark, smoking pockmarks of bullet impacts. Both wings chewed off. Paladin rolled and pulled back on the stick, easing out of the dive. He cast a glance over his shoulder and glimpsed what was left of the Fury's fuselage, spiraling toward the airfield. He looked away. He wasn't squeamish by any means, but there were dogfights in every direction, whirling pieces of metal, clouds of smoke, and tracers whistling past his cockpit. He had to get out of here. Paladin spied a clear piece of sky and nosed Lightning Girl in that direction. He sailed over Dalwick Airfield, not more than a hundred feet off the ground. The radio shack was on fire. Ladies and gentlemen, the radio announced, cease fire. That was an excellent demonstration of skill and daring. We regret that we only have a limited number of berths for your fighters, and that we had to resort to such a drastic selection method. But as they say... To the victors go the spoils. Overhead, a shadow darkened the clouds, which parted as a massive zeppelin began its descent. Mounted within the observation deck were a dozen machine gun nests and the gleaming noses of a hundred rockets. Three Delta 475, please climb to 1,000 feet and proceed to dock. Welcome aboard, George Washington. <laughs> 